Medical Center Hour with Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, which brings you these weekly programs throughout the academic year. Our program today is Popularizing Science in Life Magazine, 1936 to 1972, Wonders of Nature, Miracles of Medicine. For those of us of a certain generation and older, Life Magazine was a household staple when we were growing up. Back before the internet and the World Wide Web, back when TVs, even small black and white sets, were not yet in every home, much less in every room, back when newspapers came only in black and white and chiefly sported small print, Life's bold red masthead, large format, and dominant dramatic photographs offered a distinctly modern and national take on world events and popular culture. From the magazine's founding in 1936 until 1972, when its run as a weekly publication ended, Life's photojournalism arguably helped to create an American identity, even the sense that we Americans had of the 20th century as being something of an American century. Wonders of Nature and Miracles of Medicine being prominently featured on the magazine's slick pages. For more than three decades, life schooled Americans, consumers all in a burgeoning medical marketplace, schooled us in medical science. The pictures were everything, ushering into public view new treatments for cancer, intimate moments of doctoring, long-held secrets of the body. Indeed, for me, the most memorable issue of life arrived in 1965, when the magazine published Swedish photographer Leonard Nelson's breathtaking endoscopic images of human fetuses in utero. In this Medical Center Hour, historian Bert Hansen explores the presentation of science and medicine in life across the magazine's lifespan and considers the influence of such a dominant media presence on the public consciousness. In the decades since life's demise, with our perspective no longer framed by its editors and its master photographers, how have ordinary Americans come to understand science and medicine as part of our everyday life? What media forces now shape our popular perceptions of science and medicine? I'm really pleased to welcome Bert Hansen, who joins us today from Baruch College at the City University of New York. Uh, where he is professor of history, and he teaches hi American history and the history of science and medicine. You'll find some more information about Professor Hansen in your handout. His talk today draws on the scholarship that informs his recent book called Picturing Medical Progress from Pasteur to Polio, A History of Mass Media Images and Popular Attitudes in America. The UVA bookstore is here just outside the auditorium, on, outside the upper door, with copies of his book for sale. And I'm sure that Professor Hansen will gladly sign a copy uh, following the program. Our session today is the first of this year's Medical Center Hours to be co-presented with the History of the Health Sciences Lecture Series. I'd like to thank Joan Ectenkamp Klein and her staff from the Health Sciences Library's Historical Collections for partnering with us on these programs. And now, Bert Hansen and a tour of Life Magazine um, and the Miracles of Medicine and Wonders of Nature. Thank you very much. And I have two mics, if the battery goes out on one, remind me to use the other one. Um, uh, thank you for such a warm welcome. It's a special pleasure to be here. And before we dim the lights, I just want to hold up one issue of the magazine. Um, Many of you have seen it, uh, uh, but I do this to remind us, and you can look at it afterwards, um, that it's an artifact. It's a big, heavy, physical thing that came weekly, and families looked at, saved, and went back to old issues, saved old issues. And, and I want you to think about the size of it and the impressiveness when that face-to-face, -face, that head is as big as my head, which is so hard to judge. They're huge on the screen but you can't tell what's a little photograph or a big photograph when it's all been digitized and, and pushed through PowerPoint. So I want, I want you to have that in mind as I talk. Um, uh, it goes, there are associations with the magazine that go beyond the verbal and visual content, which I can share through the PowerPoint. So if we can dim the lights, we see them better a little bit at this point, maybe? Great. Okay. 
QA? Okay, we know the title. Okay, this is a book that's outside. In the recent book, I studied mass media newspapers and magazines from the 1870s to the 1950s because I wanted to discover what the ordinary citizen or patient was thinking and feeling about medical care and medical progress. I emphasize pictures because they have so much power on mental images. Is my mic too close? To yeah, that? actually. Did you click in there? Yeah, okay. just put it down a couple inches. Okay, good. Um, uh, I emphasize pictures because they have so much power. I'm still. I'm going to put it down about three or four inches. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so pictures because they emphasize the, the power they have to shape mental motion. Today's talk, I focus on just one large, but an especially interesting example of the general public's image of medicine, the stories and photographs of Life magazine from the late 30s to the early 70s. For many in the audience, this is history from a time before you were born, uh, but there are some here, as we know, who remember life firsthand, as well as another magazine I want you to think about, Scientific American. I'll come back to that a little bit later. So let me just ask how many of you have ever looked at one of the old issues of life, uh, maybe in a library or an antique shop or a vacation cabin? Again, <laughs> places, yes, we have some, yeah. Uh, what, what I'm exploring today through Life magazine is a more innocent era than ours, a golden age in which medicine and medical research were universally appreciated. In the era we're about to enter, the public had few ethical or political concerns about medical research or healthcare. We will also see that life integrated highly didactic articles into an inter entertaining mix, but it provided substantial scientific information that affects people's awareness of new treatments, preventive techniques, and the need for research funding. We're also going to see how life cultivated an appreciation of the wonders of nature and the pleasures associated with contemplating them, as well as a highly naturalist portrayal of the body, of human and animal experiments, and of sex. One key observation is the kind of science teaching uh, you'll be seeing in these pages became the model for the writing and graphics in the modern Scientific American when it was reinvented in 1948. Some of you read Scientific American in your high school and college years, and you might be able to recognize its distinctive visual style and its intellectual approach, which was developed first in the extremely popular Life magazine. Uh, Life magazine was established late 1936, and then my talk covers the next 36 years, to the middle of the Great Depression, uh, through the countercultural 1960s up to its sudden death in 1970. That's the last cover on the right. Uh, I'll start with highlighting what was special about life. Then the bulk of the talk will sample the stories presented in chronological order. I want to show how the medium made for a successful message. In the middle decades of the 20th century, life regularly featured progress with optimistic headlines and cover stories. Serums may cut mortality in half. Near, sorry, wrong. Uh, near the end of the war, penicillin was saluted as a miracle drug. And of course, there was the polio vaccine breakthrough. Nowadays, editors often demand of writers news you can use. And maybe that's what a public with a short attention span and little curiosity really wants. But I think it is fair to say that people who turn the pages of today's general interest magazines, like Time or People, often rush through them and have little desire to save the contents or to save the issues. It was quite a different world that we're entering 50 years ago when family homes, barber shops, and doctor's offices held onto their old covers of life. And people went back to these issues again and again for the delight and satisfaction they continued to find there. In the 50s, the news was optimistic even about curing cancer. And the surgical breakthrough stories during the final years of life as a weekly are widely known and perhaps remembered firsthand by some in this room. Uh, after the death in 72, it was reborn in the 80s as a monthly. It was there to pursue the artificial heart stories in both triumph and tragedy. But like the heart patients it covered, the revived magazine never did well, and it died a second death in May 2000. But this talk is about the first 36 years. 
I argue that the medical coverage up to the 60s is more interesting and more important than what happened after life's quality started to fade. Remember, of course, that there was yet no public TV with the science and nature programming we now take for granted. The weekly version died in 1972 after 1,900 continuous weekly issues. It was not able to handle competition from color TV and from the proliferation of more specialized magazines like Sports Illustrated, Psychology Today, and People magazine. Now, historians of science and medicine have largely ignored life's place in popular culture. I suspect it was overlooked as a venue for science because it was so easy to think of life is populated mostly by starlets and celebrities, by fashion and frivolity. I use this dust jacket to represent the recent scholarly writing about Life magazine. It's a strong collection of essays analyzing such themes as race, gender, sexuality, and corporate imagery. But the book has nothing to say about Life's treatment of science and medicine, or at least nothing beyond a short discussion of a famous photo essay the Country Doctor by W. Eugene Smith, a very popular set of images that we'll come back to in a minute. Now, my search in life has turned up about 1,100 medical articles in those roughly 1,900 issues, an average of about two per month. So there's a, there's a continuous presence in people's lives. It wasn't just an odd story now and then. And of course, I must have missed some. As you glance with me over a tiny sampling of those 1,100 stories, I ask you to keep in mind three important features of life's coverage of medicine. I'll say more about each as we go along, but let me announce them in advance. First, I want you to notice how life celebrates both the scientific ideas and the practical benefits, and not just about news you can use. The ideas are very central to its presentation. Second, please note just how much genuine information is presented in these papers. And third, consider how aesthetic choices and design styles make the celebration and the instruction so effective. Life's mission was announced by the founder, Henry Luce, in the following words. And these come from important perspectives before the first issue. To see life, to see the world, to eyewitness great events, to watch the faces of the poor and the gestures of the proud, to see strange things, machines, armies, multitudes, shadows in the jungle, and on the moon, to see man's work, his paintings, towers, and discoveries. To see things thousands of miles away. Things hidden behind walls and within rooms. Things dangerous to come to, the women that men love, and many children. To see and take pleasure in seeing. To see and be amazed, to see and be instructed. To see things hidden, to see and be amazed, to see and be instructed. Not only did life aspire to amaze and instruct ordinary Americans, <coughs> its instant popularity gave it a large and engaged readership. Its circulation rose quickly into the millions, and furthermore, the way people passed copies <coughs> around and saved them for years gave its images a unique hold on the public's consciousness. Life's impact was based on a huge circulation, a requiring an innovative production effort, especially the coded paper for printing sharper photos than found in newspapers and their Sunday supplements. The scale was staggering. A single week's issue required 7 million pounds of paper, 200,000 pounds of ink, and bundling it for shipment took 400 miles of wire. The magazines filled 360 railroad cars every week. Now, Life Magazine's attention to science was not casual. And this surprised me at first. From the outset, and right from the top of the magazine's leadership, science was accorded a special status, even given exemption from constraints affecting other coverage. Founding editor Henry Luce himself made the case in these words. We shall not insist that science shall always be pictorially arresting. In fact, the science will give the privilege of not being pictorially arresting. We will be happy to have pictures which, if given a little time and study by the reader, this is a popular magazine, study by the reader, will yield information which sticks. The fact is that today most people, most educated people, walk through a world which has been amazingly analyzed by science without having the least idea of what the world looks like to the eye of the geologist, the engineer, the astronomer, the biologist, the chemist, or the bacteriologist. 
by learning only a little about how to see, life can open many eyes. Here, as elsewhere, it is necessary in life, sorry, uh, to achieve a reputation. We must put up a sign, honest signs, sold here. Thus, it is necessary to avoid printing inferior or foolish signs in order not to confuse the reader. Foolishness there can be in life, but let it be definitely in miscellaneous pages. Let us avoid foolishness in, or insignificance in science and art unless it is deliberately labeled as such. Luce won an honesty in science coverage, but he got celebration as well, and that was in keeping with the magazine's general approach to all its subjects. In his own words, life has a bias. Life is in favor of the human race. And is hopeful. Life likes life. Life is quicker to point with pride than to view with alarm. In fact, he was once admonished one of his editors. I always thought it was the business of time to make enemies and of life to make friends. In Life magazine, medical achievements were frequent, and these photo stories cultivate an appreciation for doctors and nurses as well as for medical discoveries. We'll have a more uh, We'll have more medical breakthroughs in a minute, but let me highlight the kind of science education found in life. Life self-consciously played the role of a friendly teacher using show and tell as a way to provide knowledge to the world and a stimulus to exploring further. This was especially important in life's early years when few Americans attended college and fewer than half attended high school in the late 30s when it started. And this image, uh, not a classy image, a kind of ugly fish, uh, spread across two pages. But the image is odd, and the headline, uh, uh, of course, leads us in centuries. Most amazing scientific find is this live fish of 50 million years ago, setting up the question of living fossils. So people, whether they thought much about geological time, whether they thought about fossils, living fossils, um, here they're introduced to it. Uh, in a friendly way at their home, but it uses the image to grab us first and then move on. And here in a sequence of four images, uh, we can see a clear story there in the, those four images. And I suspect that people retain life's powerful images long after putting down the magazine. In my own view, life achieved the sustained information effect primarily by means of its design and its graphics. This is the first cover. Uh, it's a famous one I used at several points here. The power of these iconic photographs springs from their composition and design, which together give them secure places in our brain, apart from the general clutter of all the things we're seeing. We'll return in a moment to aesthetics, but I uh, want to say a little more first about the science in life and about Henry Luce's ambition to edify as well as entertain, and also about the ways he brought professional level science into the magazine. As mentioned, Luce wanted to keep life's presentation of science honest. Their science coverage seems to me grounded in philosophical naturalism, one might even say a materialism, that included an unlinked approach to sex education and animal experiments. And in the magazine's consistent support for expanding the frontiers of knowledge in all fields, and in its support for a calm, secular approach to sex, birth, and birth control, not to speak of Darwin's theory of evolution, I see evidence of progressive and liberal values, of a kind of secular humanism, which we might not have expected from the conservative capitalism of the Time Life Empire from the Vietnam War era to the present. Here, as elsewhere, they use photographs of observers as a way to draw readers into the story as active observers themselves. And this in a family magazine. Now, Life magazine was primarily a photography show, and we need to consider style and aesthetics. Life aimed high, it secured the best photographic work of the century. And the magazine's goal was to have the pictures tell the story. As one editor explained it, pictures showed what was happening. <coughs> In truth, the words underneath the picture were the illustrations, reversing their normal roles in most printed texts. The story was carried by the picture. 
What you did with the caption was answer the questions excited by the pictures. Life photographers had many aesthetic approaches and styles, but I would call attention to, to two very common characteristics among them. First, there's a love of symmetry and rhythm. Again and again, groups of people and objects had the choreography of a ballet or the symmetry of dance numbers in the Busby Berkeley movies of the mid-1930s. A second element I will call quirkiness, odd contrasts or extreme examples. It could involve the rare or exotic, but more frequently it just captured the mundane from an odd angle, as when microphotography brought viewers into the body's interior. You can judge for yourself as we review these stories whether I'm correct about how well the photos worked. Others have been less sympathetic to life photography, so I'll open with a critic. Ask yourself whether or not you agree with the famous media theorist, Marshall McLuhan, the man who first declared that the medium is the message. He complained in 1948 that the pictorial basis of Life magazine was nursery entertainment for homo boobians. He wrote that it's Pictures and ads produce an aura of sentimental awe for the subrational reception of rapid fire prose. <coughs> and he complained that his penny arcade vision was a dangerous affront to knowledge. And here we have maybe one of the photos he was thinking about, um, about the Science Museum in Cologne, open with a shot of a technician preparing the exhibit. Uh, twins offered both quirkiness and symmetry, and they were used to illustrate a story on heredity. In the 1930s, blood transfusion was still a new procedure and a big advance, so life returned to it again and again, such as this story about a veterinary convention. Now again, the picture is not great as a picture per se, but it's, you start looking and there's the chandeliers and there's the holes ceiling and there's the horses in the middle and a sand pit in the middle of a ballroom in a hotel. Okay? So that's what draws you in and there is a caption that you can then go to. I'll tell you what's going on. With success in establishing blood types for the horses, they could now perform safe transfusions even in a hotel ballroom. These veterinarians also witnessed a live demonstration of a cow's artificial insemination. But life did not run that photo, despite the magazine's frequent celebration of sex and reproduction. This man was not only a vaudeville strong man, but a champion donor who had given nearly 900 pints of blood. One of life's most famous photographers uh, took a different approach. He employed neither quirkiness nor visual symmetry. Instead, he created narratives using painterly artistry and a dramatist's ability to evoke personality and values. Some of the magazine's greatest photo pictures were done by W. Eugene Smith, and their continued popularity has been ensured by the frequent reprinting of the images. Smith's Country Doctor story appeared in 1948, the same year that McLuhan was criticized in the magazine and it allowed viewers to feel they were entering the medical practice of a small town physician in Colorado. Another big medical photo essay by Smith, somewhat less famous today, but still well known, appeared three years later in 1951, when he brought to a wide audience the skill, dignity, and devotion to patients of the nurse midwife Maud Callan of Pineville, South Carolina. Later, when Smith looked back over his entire career, he said this story gave him the most satisfaction. While life generally avoided advocacy and campaigns, it knew what it was doing when this story mentioned in passing that Maud Cannell really needed a clinic building in which to work, alongside her house calls and the classes for midwives she held in churches. The article said it would cost $7,000, an impossible sum for a practitioner serving the rural poor. But not surprisingly, readers started sending checks. And just 16 months later, life ran a follow-up story. They could now photograph her new building, and they noted with pride that she had received $19,000 mailed to her by life readers. 
But life's medical stories were not primarily these elegant human interest photo essays, even if some of these are now the most famous. As a weekly, its medical stories were primarily news stories with specials of microphotography now and then. So for the rest of my time, I want to run through images in chronological order as if turning the page of the magazine. And I ask you to observe how artistry served instruction. And you will also see consistent enthusiasm for laboratory medicine and clinical research with substantial attention to the value of experiments using animals often showing them as happy survivors. For an early story in cancer research, life crowded its cover with mice. Here is the enemy, living cancer. Some captains in the cancer world. Mice replace men on the cancer battlefield. Doctors can find and cure early cancer. Metastasis, cancer on the move. This article, by the way, prompted a flood of commendation letters from doctors and medical scientists. And you see the, the direct photography in all of it. And actually, the upper left photo is kind of interesting of a uh, uh, needle going into a woman's breast. Um, this is the kind of image that would have been forbidden in Hollywood movies, where the haze coat prevented you ever seeing needle going through the skin. Um, and it's here, and it's, it's there for the public. Um, and even describes the orange peel skin that is associated with the cancer. So it, it doesn't hold back on that. It doesn't, doesn't push you into the more grotesque uh, aspects. But it's there. This is the naturalistic approach that I find so interesting in what we think of as a more conservative era, and we think of a family magazine. So we have a very different sense of what was appropriate for people, or people felt appropriate in thinking about this. Also, we should remember that we know from Susan Sontag that people didn't want it out of the word cancer, it was only whispered well. It may have been in some context, but she wasn't looking at Life magazine, <laughs> which was showing it uh, uh, in cross sections and, and in orange peel skin. Uh, I think I said, but anyway, again, the article, by the way, prompted a flood of commendation letters from doctors and medical societies. Only the surgeon's knife or radiation can cure cancer. And now for the next few images, we're looking at four different stories, four medical stories in one issue in June 37. Doctors join the government in making a movie to combat syphilis. Again, a forbidden topic in some media, uh, but here it is in life, uh, including the word syphilis. No, no uh, other words used to cover that. Um, uh, and Dr. Perrin there actually was invited to a radio interview about the same time, but told he couldn't use the words venereal disease, gonorrhea, or syphilis in talking about this, and he refused the interview. But life did it. The Frontier Nursing Service brings health care to Kentucky Mountaineers. We're offered views of Viennese medical exhibit, more and more quirkiness. And here is the first of several stories about a wealthy young man, Fred Snight, struck with polio in China, now embarking on a $50,000 journey back to Chicago. That's a lot of money in the 30s. Um, back to Chicago in a newly invented respirator called an iron lung. This is how people um, heard about them, and it's not that different than one that you have on campus here in the rare book room. Yours might be a little bit later, maybe. Um, an early issue introduced one of life's most popular regular features. They called it Speaking of Pictures. The inaugural title was understated, simply, This is a Brain Operation. But the novelty of these photos, and more likely than later issues, would garner continuing interest from professionals as well as from lay people. And once life's reputation for medical close ups grew, and started to brag about the praise it was receiving from doctors, satire of the fad appeared in the New Yorker magazine. I already did that. What else does it say? <laughs> <laughs> and a few months later, readers were invited to look inside an egg with rare images of a developing chick embryo. Now, there might not be much real science in these two pages or any new technical information. 
But I see these fascinating images as an example of life's wowing its readers with what people in the 19th century called the wonders of nature. But no, these wonders are presented without a higher meaning or any argument about design or purpose in nature. Therefore, the pleasure of viewing and thinking about the complexity of things. In TV, A Menace and a Mystery, a lengthy series of photographs showed several forms of patient care. The left-handed photo was captioned, Science helps the tuberculosis. Readers were also taught something about basic research <coughs> and about the history of a pioneering institution. At Trudeau, the first US rest cures were made. Pneumonia mortality may be cut in half by the use of new serums. This is 1937. This slightly abstract image of something in a beaker makes us curious about the caption, which explains that healthy lungs float in water and diseased lungs sink. These are mouse lungs in the, the beaker. Uh, so again, we use the, the image to draw us into the story. Um, this extinct therapy is now largely forgotten, except by historians. But for a half century, it was the most prominent example of a successful cure produced by animals in the laboratory. Although antibiotics would later control pneumonia, in the early years, we had to identify the specific bacterial strain in the patient, and then give prompt treatment with a serum of the same type and to save thousands of lives at the time. A lot of the time of uh, interns and residents was spent typing pneumonia bacteria to see if the hospital had the right. And it went from, first there were six strains, and then there were 30-some strains. Um, but it was all got, got eclipsed by pneumonia in the early 40s. But this is very important uh, for the first 40 years of the century. When life reported on Senate hearings for a controversial new campaign against venereal disease, the magazine's strong naturalistic sympathies were clear. This was equally true for the promotion of a campaign to reduce maternal and infant mortality. A week before publishing stills from an educational film entitled Birth of a Baby, they mailed a warning letter to all subscribers so the birth photos could be removed by parents who might feel a need to keep this from children's eyes. Of course, the warning prompted even more interest. It seemed few parents removed the pages, and many wrote in to say how interesting all this was to their children. But photos of a naked infant and a draped pelvis were deemed obscene by some police officers who gave life extra publicity by confiscating issues at newsstands. Also in 1938, Light published something they called a debate about animal experimentation. It was a lengthy story opening with female celebrities presenting the opposition to vivisection on one page, while seven more pages defended vivisection with emotional images like these. And before I go to that, I should say, this. This, it's one side and the amount of coverage, the two sides. It was not unfair. Both of these uh, celebrities on your left, um, yeah, your left, um, were spokespeople for the anti section movement at the time. Uh, and it didn't hurt that one of them was Hearst's mistress, Hearst the great competitor, media competitor, with those <coughs> the Hearst papers. Um, but they used, they defended the section with emotional images like these. 24 cats proved the iron lung could save children. Horse serums tested on rabbits saved children by the thousands. A 1940 article featured the newly opened National Cancer Institute. Uh, this was to be the prototype for the large-scale government-funded research which would expand so rapidly at the National Institutes of Health after the war. Sister Kenny, an Australian uh, nurse uh, who had a therapy, physical therapy for polio, her treatment of young polio victims was covered in the magazine and elsewhere as a major breakthrough in the early 1940s. And her image reappeared in children's comic books soon thereafter. I have a chapter on comic books in my book, uh, but I, I use this just to remind us 
how the media borrows from each other and echoes. So the seven-year-olds got one version, but the eight-year-olds and their parents got the other version, but, but there was a lot of back and forth. And there was also a Hollywood movie you may have seen on late night TV uh, of, this, of her story. Um, World War II, of course, pushed rehabilitation medicine to the fore, with many photo stories, including this bittersweet chorus line of one-legged veterans and a display of prosthetic arm movements. Wartime needs also prompted a bigger part of research that successfully produced synthetic quinine. And ordinary readers were presented with models of molecular structure, carefully illustrated and explained at length. Even if a single article was insufficient to teach anyone structural organic chemistry, the completeness of this kind of presentation, I believe, helped readers imagine the way scientists were working and thinking, and maybe encouraged some young people, nerdy kids at the time, we didn't call them nerds, um, to head in that direction. Using prisoners as experimental subjects to test malaria drugs was reported without hesitation or embarrassment. By 1944, penicillin was being produced on an industrial scale, seen in the kinds of elegiac factory pictures that Life loved to publish. But Life also gave us close-ups, sometimes in color, of how the drug is made from forms of common mold. We also get sources of the miracle mold infuse the research laboratory. And if these color photos, you may be thinking, are no match for the modern science books we have today, we must think back to a day when school books had no color prints at all to appreciate how unusual these images were and how effectively they brought the wonders of nature into people's homes. The following year, a major article presented germs, medical science, helps the body in its fight against six great groups of them. Even the headline hints at the baptism with six great groups. It's make us sort and categorize and not just see zillion facts, zillion images in an unsorted un un way. There's meaning and, and uh, order here. The production of biologicals used to treat germ diseases is explained. This is the story of the older vaccines and the serum for diphtheria, pneumonia, and uh, so on before the penicillin comes in. Tons of information are presented in a double page chart of disease varieties and remedies. Notice in the line along the bottom the variety of weapons being applied vaccines, serum, sulfur drugs, and so on. Now, despite the sheer volume of the information at the table, I think this remarkably accessible table. No one learns it all at once. I'm going to give you a close-up of part in a second. No one learns it all at once. But the matrices allow a reader to browse different aspects at his or her own pace and curiosity. You can read down vertically all about one germ. Or you can read horizontally, learning about which remedies are at hand, and then move upward for examples of one weapon like sulfur drugs. As you look at that, let me digress for a moment in this chronology to know that it was just about this time that Life lost its first long-term science editor, a man named Gerard Peel, who had done it for about six years. Then they lost his successor, Dennis Flanagan, who left after one year. Flanagan joined with Peel in buying out the Moribund Scientific American magazine, which had been around since the 19th century, but was not of interest to many people in the 1940s, although it had a subscription list, which they bought and the name. These two men put the magazine on a totally new course, and they achieved great international success. I think many of you will recognize covers like this, the classic ones. Um, these are from the 70s. Um, these two editors quickly turned it into a major vehicle for scientific popularization and science education, with stories that appealed to scientists who wanted to read about their colleagues' work in other fields. This is a great insight. While working at Life, Peel had learned that scientists and doctors were among the most avid readers of his science sections. And he carried this idea and other aspects of Life's handling of science, I believe his design as well, to his new magazine. Two of the insights from Work at Life were crucial to designing the new magazine. First, enthusiastic reader response from doctors, engineers, and scientists 
taught him that every expert is an amateur outside of his or her own specialty and wants to read about what was happening in other branches of science. Second, he learned that scientists were a special type of subject for feature articles, since they needed to allow photographers to disrupt their work, often for as long as a week. Here you have life in the back of China and America up front. Um, but in terms of doing the stories, they had to send in photographers who would disrupt the scientist's laboratory, shooting and reshooting photographs with bulky lights and other experiments. They even asked scientists to restage experiments repeatedly for the camera. You might think back to the chimp putting the boxes together to climb up for the bananas. That's probably not a sequence of two or three seconds in a row. Uh, but the product is great in the magazine, but we should pause to think about what that might have entailed. Um, and also, to work with scientists, he departed from standard journalistic practice, and he allowed them to review stories for accuracy before publication. This arrangement worked splendidly for life, and it suggested to Peel that his new popular magazine could successfully use real scientists rather than reporters as the authors of some of its stories. I suspect that many of us here have read this magazine, perhaps his handouts in college science courses. And if so, you can probably bring to mind your own deeply imprinted diagrams and charts, whether photosynthesis, Mendel's peas, or the discoveries of Galileo. Back to life. Of four color pages were still rare in the mid 40s, but science stories got their share. Liquid plastic was here injected into cadaver blood vessels and created a mold of the circulation. In 49, Life's five-page report on the surgical breakthrough for blue babies opened to the saved child holding Anna, one of the dogs used in the experiments and now retired. This same year brought new treatments like cortisone for crippling arthritis. But life wasn't only about dancing patients and breakthroughs in surgery. This spread on polio in August 49 explained the anatomy and physiology of the disease. Um, this is life, but if, you, if you're familiar with Scientific American, you can almost see those same diagrams, uh, especially the two-color printing uh, in, those, in those handouts you had in science courses. Other pages used photos to show preventive action and modes of therapy. The following year, a story about research on an artificial heart opened with doctors and diagrams, but closed with three happy dogs who would live for various intervals on a mechanical heart. In 1951, Life took credit for major reforms in American mental hospitals, resulting from its expose five years earlier. As in other medical stories, before and after photographs were very effective in highlighting stark contrasts. Here, the governor of Minnesota is tossing straitjackets onto a bonfire. And again, in a certain sense, bonfires all look alike. <laughs> uh, there's no artistry in the photography. But it's the striking because it's this photo in that story, and it sticks with you and really embeds that piece of the story about change, the governor, straight jackets, and so on. So the image, I think, stays with people uh, and remembers the basic core thread of that story. Then in 1953, doctors reported that tobacco tar induced cancer in mice. And the article highlighted the parallel increases in cigarette use and human lung cancer over time. This is 11 years prior to the big Surgeon General's report on smoking. In the 50s, the generally upbeat polio stories finally could announce a long-awaited vaccine breakthrough. Here's Salk at the beginning of a large-scale human trial. In early 55, the new vaccine was stockpiled for mass application, hoping the prior year's massive field trial would prove its value. And it did, of course. Then the positive results were met with exhilaration all around. Polio vaccine was celebrated as a breakthrough in all magazines and newspapers across the country for the summer of 1955. Above the photo of a young patient, life pictured scientists listening to the results of the year's field trial, announcing that mass use was now authorized. So it's not only a large trial that involved millions of people who had to give consent uh, for the test, um, but 
Think of how the general public is learning about controlled experiments, about testing, about safety, as well as about effectiveness, as well as getting excited when it all works. Um, in June 56, Life man ran a major story proclaiming a causal link between smoking and cancer. This was an early shift from correlation to cause, eight years before the Surgeon General's report would solidify that notion. As we now know today from the release of the cigarette industry's private documents and lawsuits, this article shook up the industry. Tobacco company leaders immediately meant to plan their response. Among the possibilities they considered were a strong protest and release the general press. A full page ad in Life could balance the story. A counteracting story in Look. An immediate press conference and a private approach to Henry Luce, the editor-in-chief. Choosing the last option, they secured a meeting with Luce and his editors in less than two weeks. After the meeting, John Hill of Hill and Knowlton, the public relations executive, wrote in a private memo, I think we are now on a better footing there. But within less than a year, Life published another article of a research on the dangers of smoking. But most of Life's cancer stories in the 50s were about new therapeutic or diagnostic possibilities, like this cover story in May 58, in which Life revived the bat reviewed the battle line and reiterated an old promise of fresh hope on cancer. Even predicting we were on the brink of breakthroughs. This story ran for a full 12 pages. But please note this example of a new style of illustration, using anonymous figures in soft focus, an approach that seemed closer to a romance magazine than to a science book. But while life had no worries in 1959 about research experiments on prisoners or animals, it did report for the first time about some disturbing changes in medical care. The cover introduced a four-part series. The first part lamented the passing of traditional doctor-patient relationships, trying to retain sympathy as an element in practice. Of course, through the Luke Files painting was the obligatory illustration for this topic. As the 50s gave way to the 60s, life's consistent triumphalism was giving in to episodes of ambivalence and doubt, and at the same time, doubt, ambivalence and doubt about medicine. And at the same time, life started replacing their classic documentary style with other sorts of less subjective reporting. And this is a larger trend in journalism at the time. It's not just in life, but it shows up as right when you need to me. They also started to abandon their long-standing commitment to having the pictures tell the story. Now they were printing much longer texts, and the editors often demoted photos to mere illustration or decoration. Let me share just one example of the new style this article. In this article, the images no longer propel the story, and the reporter even changed the names of his subjects. And again, fuzzy photos and eight columns crowded with words. Now, the new ambivalence about medical progress in the 60s is most seen, is seen most clearly in the 1962 solidified story, which takes on several tough issues. Readers were first introduced to the tragedy of children being born as a major reformers. But the magazine also celebrated the heroism of a government scientist, Dr. Francis Kelsey, whose courage and determination saved so many from this peril. This long feature then examined the uncertainty faced by pregnant women and it